Coming up on DTNS, why 5G phones will get cheaper next year, the triumphant return of Microsoft Power Tools, and how long does it take to charge a darn electric car? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 6, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Allison Sheridan from the Podcast Empire. And from the shores of Lake Erie, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm today's producer, Anthony Lemos. Yes, Roger Chang uh, having a power outage today, uh, so he may be joining us midway or not. Uh, we wish him speedy return of his power. Uh, we were just talking about podcasting and levelating and all kinds of uh, good technology stuff on Good Day Internet. You can join that wider conversation by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. LG announced the G8X ThinkQ that comes with a case containing a secondary display similar to the V50. However, the G8X display case connects by USB-C, not wirelessly. That's the distinction. Both displays are 6.4 inch OLED FHD plus with an aspect ratio of 19.5 by 9. The case also has a 2.1 inch monochrome OLED display for time and notifications, although no price or release date as of yet. Bruce. But uh, oh, well, the idea of having two your audio crapped out again, Allison. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> that was a sad robot. No. That was a melting witch. Uh, we will check back with you in a minute. Uh, TF Securities analyst Ming Chi Kuo says his sources indicate Apple will indeed release small circular tags that can be attached to bags, electronics, keys, etc., similar to how tile tags work, if you know those. The tags are expected to use ultra wideband, which Kuo believes will be supported by all three new iPhones this year. Ultra wideband is considered more accurate than Bluetooth LE, which is what tile uses, though the tags might might also support Bluetooth LE since the previous iPhones don't support ultra wideband. And if you pre ordered the Samsung Galaxy Fold through Samsung last spring, Samsung's canceling that pre order while it rethinks the entire customer experience for the Galaxy Fold, probably not for its entire business. To be clear, these were people who had expressed the wish to buy a Fold, asked Samsung not to cancel their pre order but they weren't charged. Still, Samsung's granting them a $250 credit for anything in the Samsung online store. Pre-orders are not currently open for the Galaxy Fold, but pre-registration is. That allows you to get notified when pre-orders become available. Uh, they do need to rethink that entire customer experience. They're right. It's the promise ring of pre-ordering. <laughs> yes. You know, we'll get there. We're about to get engaged. The Wall Street Journal reports that in the first half of 2019, U.S. music sales rose 18 percent to five point four billion dollars with streaming now accounting for 80 percent of all revenue, which is up 26 percent on the year. Paid streaming service revenue grew 31 percent to three point three billion dollars. According to the RIAA, in that period, streaming services ad added more than one million subscribers per month with a total of sixty one point one million U.S. subscribers at the end of June. But that's not all that was up. CD sale revenue grew 5% in the first half to two, uh, $485 million. And vinyl sales continuing to grow 13% this time to $224 million. Last week's Google Project Zero detailed a vulnerability it found in iOS that had been fixed by Apple in February. Uh, but that's the one that would allow an attacker to infect a phone simply by having it visit a website. Now, uh, it turned out Monday, we found out that some of those websites were probably targeted at the Uyghur community, an Islamic community in China. Friday, Apple announced that the attack was narrowly focused on fewer than a dozen websites that focus on content related to the Uyghur community. Apple also said the attacks appeared to have been in operation for two months. If you remember, Project Zero had suggested that the attacks could have been underway for two years. Possibly it means the vulnerability was there for two years, but Apple is claiming that the attacks only showed up in the past or in the two months uh, leading up to the, the fixing of the bug. I All thought right. that was a pretty good uh, answer back from Apple because they didn't say the vulnerabilities weren't there. They didn't say the attacks didn't happen, but they gave a lot more context to it than the way Google said, it's yeah. everybody, you're in danger. They, they also added a little like finger wagging at, yeah. at Google, but the context was good. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, in fact, they were the first company to confirm what the websites were uh, that were targeted and, and, and to say that it was not that many in case you were worried, like, did I visit one of these? It becomes a much more narrow in that case. Yeah. They left that question open. 
Well, Apple published a beta version of a web interface for Apple Music at beta.music.apple.com. The beta is available to all Apple Music subscribers and, according to Apple, should work with all modern browsers, including those on Windows 10, Chrome OS, and Android. The interface is similar to the standalone music app coming in macOS Catalina. While it can access all music, playlists, and most radio stations, it doesn't include Beats 1, some video content, and smart playlists. You also can't sign up for Apple Music through the web interface just yet. Yeah, but it sounds like they're going to add those things. Uh, so it is a beta after all. I, I think that that's fair. And uh, I don't know, kind of a smart move by Apple if they want more people to buy their services to make it available cross-platform through the web. You and know, yeah, I'm a fan of not loading that bloatware of iTunes anymore. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I, I I use my iTunes app on on Mac OS. It's fine. Uh, I primarily just all I do is is access the radio version of Apple Music. Uh, so the web interface is not something that I need. I'm also looking forward to the Apple Music upcoming app um, in Mac OS. But yeah, for everybody else, another option. Uh, you're going to get more Apple Music subscribers this way. Well, especially when you start letting them sign up. But yes, yeah, certainly, uh, the more opportunities you have to use it, then the more people might be deciding to use it. And Spotify is cracking down harder on their family sharing plan uh, these days, which I know caused some people to say, well, maybe I will switch after all, because Apple has slightly different terms with the family uh, sharing. So you know, we'll see. Uh, Spotify has always required you to be in the same household. They just didn't enforce it as much as they seem to be doing now. New York State Attorney General Letitia James announced her office is launching a multi-state investigation into Facebook for potential antitrust violations, along with attorneys general from Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Nebraska, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, and the District of Columbia. The investigation will focus on whether, quote, Facebook's actions may have endangered consumer data, reduced the quality of consumer choices, or increased the price of advertising. Facebook revealed in July that it's also facing an antitrust investigation from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. So shouldn't be a shock when the New York State joins in, as they often do in these cases. Endangering consumer data seems like, yep, that's a thing uh, that you can you can put on Facebook, certainly. Increasing the price of advertising, uh, that's a little bit murkier for me. Um, uh, reducing quality of consumer choices, well, there isn't really a choice that's comparable to Facebook. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's that's one of those arguments that you can say, okay, well, Facebook doesn't really have a competitor in that realm, but has it kept somebody from becoming the competitor in that realm? Well, well and they've that's... bought some competitors, right, exactly. with, with uh, WhatsApp and um, what's the other Instagram. one? Instagram. Instagram. I mean, you, you can't not be on a Facebook platform anymore, it seems. Yeah, I mean your 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 competitors are TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter. Um, you know, arguably then you start drifting off into the LinkedIn's of the world that are a little more specialized, right? So uh, I I I think what they'll go after here is I, I don't know if they can show that that Facebook has increased the price of advertising. There actually is pretty well, there is competition with advertising. It's called Google, but also Amazon. Uh so I don't know that they'll determine that one. Consumer choice would have to do with Yes, you you buy your competitors and and keep choices from from becoming highly competitive. Uh, but endangering consumer data seems to be their best bet if they were going to make some charges stick. You yeah. think? You think there there's some meat on those bones, Tom? <laughs> well, there there's certainly a lot of people look at those bones and see meat. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Facebook has competitors, sure, but every but all the competitors that were just listed are competitors of one part of Facebook because Facebook is so many things now, which is, I think that that's where the argument is, is there still is not one single umbrella company that is functioning the way Facebook right. is now. And and, and, and and can it exist? And could Instagram or WhatsApp have grown into that by diversifying and adding things if you hadn't bought them? I, I think that's how that argument will go. Absolutely. Qualcomm has some announcements of its own. It's bringing 5G to its Series 6 and 7 chipsets, which are used in mid-range phones. The chips will support key regions and frequency bands, including MM wave and sub-6 gigahertz spectrum. That means that 5G phones come in next year at more affordable price points. Woo! Qualcomm says that 12 manufacturers have signed on to use the Snapdragon 7 Series 5G mobile platform and sampling of the chips has begun with availability in phones after Q4 2019. The Series 6 5G mobile platform for lower cost phones should start showing up a little later in the second half of next year. 
And obviously, 5G is not going to be penetrating. Even, even in the second half of next year, it's not going to be available in a lot of places. So you'll want the cheaper options to be available once 5G comes to you. This seems like it's going to happen. Uh, millimeter wave means you get those really, really fast speed potentials if your service supports it. So, you know, this is this is all good stuff. It's got to make things cheaper. Yeah, and and people, there is a lot of price pressure on phones right now. So if you want to sell five G phones, you're you're going to have to have those mid range three hundred, four hundred dollar phones having five G built in. This is a this is a way to make that happen. Uh, in a related note, Huawei announced its own chipset with an integrated five G modem, the seven nanometer Kirin nine ninety five G. Though its integrated modem does not support millimeter wave, so that makes it quite a bit less competitive with the Qualcomm one. Uh, is that the chip is slower. They, that means that its maximum potential speed is slower. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, the chip itself has eight cores with two cores capable of clock speeds of 2.86 gigahertz. Also has a 16 core Mali G76 graphics processor and a three core neural processing unit, along with Huawei's fifth generation image signal processor uh, for DSLR, DSLR level noise reduction. Huawei also announced a new phone. I'm using quotes because it can come with Android 10 pre-installed something it's unable to do with most of its new phones right now because of U.S. trade restrictions. However, this new phone is really the existing P30 Pro, but available in two-tone matte and glossy finish in either blue or lavender, uh, meaning it can take advantage of the easement that allows Google to provide updates to existing models. The Huawei Mate 30, a wholly new phone, will launch September 19th and so far is not allowed to have Google services on it. So that September 19th is when we'll really see what Huawei's plan to deal with a post-Google operation is going to be for the rest of the world outside of China anyway. They're staying relevant on that. That's, that's an interesting strategy to make it new, but it's really this old one over here? I mean, I think they wanted to announce something at IFA, and yeah. that was the best they could come up with. <laughs> that's what I have, there's, a, there's somebody out there who's like, I like this new finish. Great. I was going to get the phone maybe anyway. Sure. But not? for the most part, I, I don't know how many people are going to be like, wow, they figured out a way to get around the restrictions against the company. <laughs> it buys them time. lavender. Yeah. <laughs> it's the lavender revolution. Mm. Well, Microsoft released two new utilities that I'm totally jealous of under the revived Power Toys name. The first is a Windows key shortcut guide. You hold down the Windows key and it puts up a full screen overlay with a list of dynamic keyboard shortcuts based on what windows and apps you have open. I've seen this done on other apps and I really like that, that it's system-wide here. The other utility is a windows manager called Fancy Zones and you just gotta love that name. You set up custom zones on screen, hold the shift key down and drag an app onto the zone and it automatically resize, resizes to fit. And both utilities are available on GitHub. Uh, I called these power tools at the beginning of the show, but they, they are powerful tools I, in my defense. <laughs> but they're uh, fun but and fancy. Power toys. Fancy. Power toys for Windows 98, uh, Windows XP. Uh, I mean, uh, I miss them. And it's nice to see them bring that brand back. The, like you say, the, the Windows key shortcut guide is useful. That, that's pretty cool. But fancy zones is 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 good. That's That's what I expect from a power toy, right? The, that puts oh, yeah. the power in it. It's not just a toy. It's it's a power toy. <laughs> Both of my kids use Windows at work and uh, they're Mac users at home. And they complain to me. They say they always talk about how the windowing is better on Windows. And I mean, I guess they named it Windows, so it should be better. But uh, the fact that like you can snap to the screen to the left and the right, right. and things like oh, that. Uh, so yeah. They're going to be all over these power toys. I'm totally jealous. Yeah. Uh, power toys was Windows 95. Mm. Uh, thank you, Captain Jack. Uh, for that. So power tools for Windows XP, not true. Power toys for Windows 95, true. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the fancy zones thing because it may be hard for you to imagine if you don't go look at the video of it in action, but it basically says, you know, when I when I use the shift key and drag over here, it'll just automatically make it a block that that is that corner over there. So it's it's a powerful version of the snap to the side that that gives you a little more customization. It's pretty cool. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. A lot of folks like the idea of electric charging for their car, 
but worry about the charging part of it because, hey, I know where the gas stations are. I can carry a, a can of gas in a spare can in my car, but I can't really carry a spare can of electricity. Uh, I got to plug this thing in. Allison, you've got an electric car. How long does it take to charge these things up? <laughs> well, after about my uh, Tesla Model 3, I can't not know what the number of people say, how long does it take to charge? I wrote a blog post on this because it's a key question. Uh, my father asked this kind of question, how big is a lump of coal? Well, I don't know, it depends on a whole lot of things. Um, the first thing to think about, of course, is it has to do with how much charge you start with and how much you want to have when you're done. If you only need to go 10 miles, it doesn't take very long at all. And the other thing is it depends on where you are in the charge curve. So batteries are linear up to about 65% lithium-ion batteries charge about linear. Uh, so it'll be a constant rate. But after about 65%, they start rolling off. And uh, so they don't charge as quickly in that last uh, two th or last third of the uh, charge. So that matters too. You're going to get fast at the beginning, slower later. The other thing that that matters a lot is what kind of charger are you plugged into. If you just plugged into your 110 volt at your house, uh, it's at three miles per hour, and it's kind of a funny way to to think about charging, but it oh, is. I think I get it. So if three miles in one hour. hour I've added three miles of range to the car. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds funny at first, but yeah. then if you, if you go up to 240, if you get a 240 outlet with say at 40 amps, it's going to do it at 35 miles per hour. So overnight you're fine. You know, yeah. you could go, you can go full range of the car. Model three, um, the higher range ones go to 310 miles. So I can, I can fill the car up overnight. Um, there's other company chargers too. So you can take a Tesla over to a Honda dealer or to a BMW dealer. And that, the, but the one near my house, the Honda one is 150 miles per hour, but the BMW one is 20 miles per hour. So how long does it take to charge a car? Depends on that. If you go to a, a Tesla supercharger, I had clocked it at 500 miles per hour at the beginning. Uh, it, it slowed down a little bit after that when I'm 340 miles per hour. So we're now up 10 faster. Uh, yeah, interesting if you're a supercharger and they, they have a lot uh, of we're, losing you. Uh, we're losing you again. Are, are you, you going to talk about temperature? Uh, well, wasn't it? Yeah, I was the supercharger cutting the speed off. Uh, sharing a supercharger cuts the speed in half. So, uh, so what you're saying is if I go up to a supercharger and somebody's already plugged into it and I plug into it, on one then, side. Yeah, then their speed goes down and I won't get the full speed out of it. Right. And and uh, and and apparently it, it matters which Tesla you use too because uh, the, there's different amps uh, depending on whether you have a Model Three, a Model S, and a Model X. Right, it uh, definitely there's a, a curve that you can see from uh, Tesla that tells you how fast to go depending on which which. Yeah, this is the 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 connect your connection is, is dropping out on us. Uh, it uh, unfortunately right in the middle of this, which is which is a really good explanation. And uh, thankfully, Allison is smart enough to put her explanations up at podfeet.com. So you can you can just go that. We'll have a link in the show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com to this as well. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. Go ahead. All right, good. It turns out if I hang up and you know turn off and on again, it works. The other interesting thing that you bring up temperature is um, if it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, batteries don't charge at all. It's zero it, or it's an infinite the length of time it would take. So you kind of have to actually know what the temperature outside is. And uh, if it get, uh, gets up to 113 Fahrenheit, which is 45C, it, the batteries also get unhappy. But um, one of the cool things in the Tesla is if you navigate using the navigate feature to say, I want to go to a supercharger, the, the car will actually heat condition the battery as you get closer to it. So it'll make sure that you're at the optimal temperature of your battery in order to receive as much charge as possible. So that's pretty cool. So the upshot here is, uh, depends on what amp you're plugged into, especially at home, 110 volt, it's gonna charge real slow, but but 240 will get you fine overnight. Uh, it depends on the charger you're plugged into, depends on the car that you have and what model you have. Uh, and it depends on the temperature. So a lot of it depends but in practice, Allison, <laughs> have you have you run into a situation where you needed to charge up? You were almost empty, uh, and and you needed to charge up, and and you had to wait. 
to charge? Because I think that's that's what goes through people's mind. Usually they're thinking of a road trip, but let's say they just haven't been paying attention. They're like, oh, I'm almost out of charge. With a gas station, you know how long it's going to take for you to pull up, pay at the pump, fill your gas and get on your way. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a differing trade-off. What, I, what I've noticed is that uh, I, I look at my car and I go, oh, I'm going to need some charge. I don't need to go anywhere right now. I'm going to tell it to charge right now, or I'll tell it to charge at midnight when it's cheaper, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And I haven't gotten in my car and driven over to a gas station and sat there and waited and turned around and driven back. So, you know, that's uh, say a half an hour to go do something like that if it's done on my way home. So I'm not spending that time but I can't in an emergency say I need gas right this minute for, and I need this much. I mean, I could get, you know, in, in 10 or 15 minutes, I could get enough to go a little ways depending on how far I have to go. So it's, I haven't really run into problems with that. Um, when we were up in Fresno visiting Steve's family, um, I, I love family as we all do, Sure. but, um, I had this really good excuse to go away to a Tesla supercharger for an hour and go <laughs> relax. And I read a book. I didn't have to talk to anybody. So for the that, nerds, that, that sounds like making lemons out of lemonade a little bit though. A little bit, a little bit. It was, um, so, you know, for longer trips, I mean, you are going to sit there for a while, but they, there was a ton of really good tools that you can put in. Um, there, there's a, a tool that allows you to say, okay, I want to get to this destination with this much charge. So mm -hmm. the one big thing I didn't want to have happen is show up with my brand new car and go, Oh, I got to go charge. So I said, I want half full when I get to Fresno. So we stopped at a supercharger that we didn't need to stop at to get there, but we made sure that when we arrived, we could drive everybody around and have them all go wow. And then later go on and go charge the car. I think that's what hangs people up is they're like, that sounds like a lot of planning, especially East coast drivers where they're like, there's always a gas station around. I, I'm not going to run into a situation where I needed to think it through. Maybe if you're driving out in Arizona, New Mexico, te West Texas, uh, where there, you know, there can be long stretches between gas stations. You're a little more used to thinking that way. Uh, but, but people want this to be as easy as, as lacking of planning. And I think that's what hangs people up, which is why it's interesting that there are these, these hybrid, the, uh, what is it? The Prius premium? The Prius prime. Prius prime. Is, is, that one's a real interesting car. It's, it's got two, uh, two separate things going on. It's a, it's a gas electric hybrid, not plug in for that side. So uh, when you're, when you're driving, you're using gas when it's more efficient, electric, when it's more efficient, you've got regenerative into the, into the uh, battery, but it's also got a separate, battery so it can run completely on battery so for 30 miles you can you can plug it in and you can charge so for all those stupid little trips around town it, you never use the gas electric side but then when you want to go long range you actually have a gas tank you can put gas into and be efficient you know be the kind of 100 uh, miles to the gallon kind of numbers or whatever it is that you get out of a, a prius so that one's kind of that's kind of a sweet spot for this interim period before We've got all, the infrastructure completely there. But I, but I would look at the total area under the curve. How much time do you spend putting gas in your car versus how much time would I spend putting electricity into my car? I don't spend any time because I mostly drive within five miles or 10 miles of my house. I'm not spending any time. I walk out to the garage, I shove in the, the uh, charger and I go back into my house. I'm spending two minutes versus 20 minutes, 30 minutes going to a gas station. I, I, in fact, I think that's a really good way to think about it because it's the use case that makes the difference, right? Yeah. Uh, how many of you, and I know there are some of you, uh, drive around near E and think, oh gosh, you know what? I need, I need to pull that over at a gas station. Me. When am I going to do that? You know what? <laughs> I, I got, but I'm to. late for work. I'll do it after work. And then after work, you're like, ah, oh, crap, I still need to fill up. <laughs> if you have that situation and you can charge at home, you're basically, if you have a 240 volt charger in your home, uh, you're basically set up to never be empty, right? Yep. You never have yeah. to go fill up, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, that's the life. Are <laughs> Priuses really getting a hundred miles to the gallon on a good day? Cause that's, that's a good number. I'm, I made I know that they number didn't up out of my head. Okay. What is it, Tom? Oh, well, mine's 17 years old, so it gets like 35 miles to the gallon at this point. But even at its top, I think it, it got around 50. Uh, I don't, yeah. I don't know what the modern, the, 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 mo the modern. I know, are. I know it's, it's, it's crept up, but yeah, I know it's, it's more, but yeah, yeah. it's, it's, uh, yeah, 
that's nice. Yes, I have I have 58 miles to the gallon is what they advertise. That's what they say. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Narrowly and, missed and, a flight you know, or two having to get gas. Yeah. yeah, the number 60 popped into my head after I said 100. They claimed 60 and then they had to back off of that. So I, because of EPA stuff, but I wasn't sure if, if they'd gotten back to that. It sounds like they've gotten close anyway. I get in, infinite. In my defense, if you, if you walk the line of E, you know how much you really have left once your car says you need gas. Mm. You're also maximum efficiency. You have spent the least amount of time going to the gas station, right? Because if you did it a half full, you'd be doing twice as often. For the most amount of time. Yeah. I mean, it's not a big deal. I haven't run out of gas on the freeway in a few years now. I fill up at half the tank no matter what, because I don't want to get caught in an emergency without No, help. you're smarter than I am. No, I don't know if it's smarter. More paranoid. Pet. <laughs> well, paranoid for a good reason. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can be paranoid or not. We want you all to submit <laughs> stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you like Facebook groups, well, we've got a good one. Lots of good folks in there having all sorts of conversations. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Brian H. Roden, and he's got an interesting solution for robocalls, which by the way, I got two of them during this very show. Brian says, I have a solution that's worked on cutting down the number of calls that I'm receiving. I'm on Verizon, which does identify potential spam and gives it a rating. But for the calls that aren't marked by Verizon, the ones with the same area code and even the same prefix that I do, those sneaky ones, I do the following. The phone either rings and I answer softly, hello, and then wait. If it's a computer voice, I just hang up. But if it's a person who starts going off of their script, I then say, Sheriff's Department, Fraud Division, how may I help you? I was getting three to four calls a day, and maybe I get three or four per week now, or even less. They seem to take your number out of the system when you answer this way. Now, this is obviously the uh, the, de the definition of, of uh, coincidental evidence. Uh, uh, this, this is not proof that if you answer the phone Sheriff's Department Fraud Division, you will be removed from lists. But, but I it's bet it's really satisfying to do that. Yeah. Oh, if it's fun, do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. Could it be considered fraud to say that? Is that impersonating a police officer? Oh. Hmm. Let's ask Facebook. They seem to know a lot about this. I used to answer <laughs> like a robot. So it would call and go, hello, this call has been answered by a robot. And that's then would, great. Oh, that's a good one. I stopped Hi. getting calls. Oh, <laughs> I seem to be having trouble with my mic. We, we have affordable health care for you. You know that one? Oh, I get her every few days or so. I never answer. I just don't answer. And then I mostly I don't, don't anymore. Don't have to think about yeah, it. Right. Of course, I, I, you no know, I have, I've missed out on several million dollar winnings and, you yep. know, yep. great warranty extensions, but mm -hmm. that overseas worried. Prince, he was going to give you all the money. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, well. uh, Liz uh, was voting or was commenting on our voting for the next live with it. That's live with it is the series that Sarah does where she spends at least three months uh, with a device to, to really live with it and find out uh, what it's like to use it. Uh, and the voting right now is going on around four wearables. Uh, Liz said those mentioning Fitbit compatibility with iOS, don't mention that the health data does not sync to the health kit platform viewable in the health app on iOS, which is where the real magic with other health info happens privately. And I think she's right. Uh, that health app, this is what Apple does, uh, really is designed to work with the Apple Watch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the Versa 2 is the Fitbit watch that is in the running. And a lot of people have weighed in saying, yeah, this seems like the best option because maybe they aren't on iOS. I am, but um, it seems to be one of one of the options that is most cross compatible. So very good point from Liz that the Apple Watch, um, not surprisingly, is something that works with iOS more than any other of its competitors. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating during the show. Len, what do you got for us? You know, uh, I think before we started the show, I said, you know, I, I had this idea for uh, t uh, Tesla's and charging, and I hope it wasn't super simple. Um, and it is a pretty simple idea overall. It's the Tesla logo that's plugged in and it looks like it's charging. But I think what really makes this image really fun and uh, and great is that I added uh, Alan Sheridan's dog, Tesla. And he says, charging <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, it just, how do it, I buy this, Len? Well, if you're a, I'm glad you asked. If you go to my Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash Len, you become a patron and you get every single one of these drawings I do every week 
in, in your mailbox or just, you know, you can download it right there. Or if you'd like to go the old fashioned route, you go to lenperaltastore.com and it's right there on the front page. Just click it and buy it. You also really nailed the asymmetrical dog ear look. Yeah. You know, one yeah. ear is kind of cocked up a little bit higher. Yeah. That's, Sarah, that's, that's why I'm a professional. Right? That's right. That's why we have you <laughs> as our illustrator. Rather than and you got her the Tesla logo that's on her chest. It's that's right. Awesome. That's right. That's why it's there. everything right. works out. It's a beautiful day. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. And also thanks to Allison Sheridan for being with us today. Allison, you work hard in the podcasting world. Where can folks keep up with the rest of your work? Well, you can head on over to podfeet.com and you can hear all about how to diagnose a dying 2016 MacBook Pro. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you've been wondering <laughs> about underlying causes of certain things during the show, well, that would be one of them. And uh, where where are you? Because I've heard you talk about this on NoSillaCast. I've heard you talk about it on the SMR podcast. Uh, are you any closer to of solving this this weird conundrum? I have not figured out everything that's wrong with it. We think it's it might all be based on the battery, that the battery is actually affecting the CPU speed, which is really weird. But um, if you could see my video, you would see my jauntily placed box to mail uh, my MacBook Pro back to Apple. Because when I went to go make an appointment at my local Apple store, it came up and said, you can get an appointment never. There are no appointments. Wow. <laughs> It's that booked, huh? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I'll be getting a new battery. And, you know, while we're there, they might as well replace the uh, the broken keys because that's what happens on these models. Oh, yeah. Might as well while I got it. Throw it uh, in. Well, good luck. I hope you get it Thank fixed you. soon. Uh, folks, we're changing our Patreon rewards. So we came up with a proposal and we'd like you to look it over. Let us know if there's anything in there you can't live with. You can find the proposed Patreon reward changes at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We also love your feedback, and our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Join us live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you all Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>